Hello and welcome everyone to another class of Atmo 620. Um, I hope you're all doing well and I hope you're ready for um, a little bit of a change of topic because uh, today we will talk about uh, stable water isotopes. Now, stable water isotopes are not strictly speaking considered um, cloud microphysics if you will and they're not included in most cloud microphysics textbooks. Um, however, I do think that um, isotopes are, water isotopes are becoming uh, more and more common in the study of atmospheric sciences. And so I think it's a good idea to, um, you know, to look at them and, and to try and, and understand, to better understand um, what, uh, what these are, just because they could be useful uh, in your uh, in your future research. Okay, so first of all, what are isotopes? Well, the story of isotopes go back goes back to um, well the kind of the early ages of the uh, atomic theory, if you will. Um, well, of course, the early days some of the atomic theory some might argue are in ancient Greece, but let's just stick to Western science. Um, you know, um, atomic theory. Um, in 1913, uh, J.J. Thompson discovered that a particular gas called neon had uh, two different kinds of atoms with different atomic weights. Okay. Um, he uh, referred to these as isotopes because isotope means same place uh, in Greece, right? And uh, that is because the two had pretty much the same uh, number of electrons, the same um, electronic configuration. Uh, by and large, they occupy the same spot in the periodic table. And so they're kind of the same thing, but different because they had slightly different masses. Um, in the next few years, isotopes became uh, more of a thing and many of them were discovered, about 200 and well, more than 200 isotopes were discovered uh, for different elements, uh, which is actually close to what we know as naturally occurring isotopes, um, and we have 287 of them. Naturally occurring, uh, it means that literally they can be found commonly in the universe. You could probably engineer isotopes that could live for, uh, you know, a, femtos a femtosecond, but you wouldn't find them in nature, okay? Um, one, some of these isotopes have a name and a surname, and one of these is uh, an, an isotope of a hydrogen that um, turned out had twice the mass of hydrogen, and uh, it was called, by Yuri, it was called deuterium, okay? This is one of the known um, isotopes of hydrogen and the only other stable isotope together with uh, the other one that was known. Uh, finally, in 1932, Chadwick clarifies what these isotopes are uh, because Chadwick discovers neutrons, and neutrons are particles within atoms, okay? Uh, I don't know how much you um, know about atoms, but just to, as a refresher, this is thanks to Chadwick and all the other ones that came after him, but essentially what's happening in these isotopes is that Atoms are made of a nucleus, okay, that contains heavy particles. And around this nucleus, there are lighter particles that kind of rotate around it. We'll see, uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about radiation a bit more. These particles are called electrons. Um, the particles uh, in, the nucleon, in the nucleus are of two kinds. Um, there, there are protons. Uh, which are electrically charged, and there are neutrons. Why were neutrons discovered later? Well, because electrons and protons kind of make sense, if you will. Um, you know, there's a nucleus that is formed by a certain amount of protons, and what the atom wants to do is acquire enough negatively charged, so, so enough particles of an, of an opposite charge to the proton to kind of neutralize the, uh, the electric field, uh, well, not the electric field, the, 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 the charge of the nucleus, okay? So, you know, 
uh, a hydrogen atom would have one proton and one electron, helium, two protons, two neutrons, uh, two protons, two electrons. Uh, but what was discovered was that in addition to these protons, there were these particles called neutrons that, ha that had pretty much the same properties and the same mass as protons, but had no uh, electric charge, okay? Also, as a reminder, uh, the, um, the mass of a proton or a neutron is about 1,836 times the mass of an electron, if I remember correctly, but it's about 2,000 times the mass of an electron. So protons and neutrons are much, much heavier than, um, than electrons, and their number is essentially what dictates uh, the mass of, of an atom, okay? So because they have different amount of neutrons, they have different weight. And if they have different weights, they're going to have different properties, okay? Uh, for example, they will have different diffusivities. Um, suppose, that, suppose that you have some kind of a, a material, okay? And the material is, I don't know, like some kind of a porous material. I don't know how to draw it. But you could imagine, you know, some kind of a crystal, you know, um, like a salt or whatever. And suppose that you're diffusing a gas through this salt, right? This could be hydrogen. And uh, the fundamental isotope of hydrogen is called protium. This is one proton and one electron, okay? Uh, deuterium is one proton, one neutron, and one electron rotating around. So some of these will be deuterium particles. And as these are diffusing through this, deuterium particles are heavier. And so, you know, when they collide, uh, they are affected by the collisions more than these these uh, sort of protium protium atoms that are faster and can go through faster. And so heavier isotopes will have um, lower diffusivities. Um, and also vapor pressure is different. You know, um, heavier particles condense more easily than uh, the sort of the light. Heavier isotopes condense more easily than the lighter isotopes, for example, okay? Of course, these are very small differences, but uh, it may, you know, these are, the, they, these may be big enough to be noticeable, okay? Also, um, the uh, process, when, when you have physical processes that affect uh, the amount of, the ratio of lighter to heavier isotopes of a certain material, these processes are known as fractionation. Okay, so if you have, <clears throat> let's say you start off with a material where you have 10% of the atoms are heavier atoms. You do something, you know, some kind of process, and you end up with only 1% of the heavier isotopes uh, to uh, the total amount of, uh, of atoms. Uh, in this case, we say that the, the, the gas, the material has fractionated, okay, because... Uh, their ratio has has changed, and what is important and that we'll discuss discuss in this class is the fact that knowing how different processes affect the isotopic composition of a given substance can tell you something about what happened to a particular sample of that substance. Okay. Uh, just to fix some notation, maybe you know this already, but. When you indicate some uh, chemical element that we call X, okay, uh, typically the way to indicate it, because X can have uh, different uh, neutrons and can have different mass, we indicate the mass up here with an A, okay, and at the bottom here we indicate the uh, electric charge of the nucleus or, you know, the proton, the number of protons in a nucleus, okay? A is the number of neutrons plus the number of protons. Uh, as an example, 
uh, carbon atoms. Carbon, write it here, has six protons in the nucleus and typically uh, the most abundant form of carbon found on this planet is it has six neutrons. So talk about carbon-12, okay? There is a form, there is, an, there is an isotope known of carbon with six protons, obviously, because otherwise it wouldn't be carbon anymore, and seven neutrons, and so this is carbon-13, okay? The ratio of one to the other is about one, uh, one to 100, more or less, one to 99, okay? Notice that some isotopes are stable and some are unstable. What does this mean? What this means is that stable isotopes are going to stay like that forever until the end of the universe. So if you have a, a carbon atom that is like this, this is going to have uh, six protons, six neutrons until the end of the universe. Uh, you could have unstable isotopes, and these would typically break down and decay in other things. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, these will decay in other things. So, for example, uh, deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen. Deuterium has one proton, one neutron, so this is a two, one proton, and this is how it's denoted, sometimes also denoted with a D. Uh, this is a stable isotope. It's going to stay deuterium forever. Um, there's another isotope known of hydrogen. This is called tritium. This has still one proton, but two neutrons. So this is one, three. This is unstable, okay? And this decays, um, if I remember correctly, uh, it has a decaying time of about uh, 11 years, but um, I'll need to double check on this. But anyway, this decays. And uh, when an isotope decays, it transforms into something else, into some other element. Um, I am not sure why it says type equation here. I don't think that there was a t an equation to type here. Um, two things that uh, we want to keep in mind is that um, something that is important to quantify is how many, how much, the fra what is the fraction of heavy isotopes to lighter isotopes, okay? Because we said this is what is affected by fractionation processes. So uh, the ratio, this ratio is denoted as R, okay? And this is the concentration of the heavy isotopes to the concentration of the lighter isotope. In this case, I'm showing yet another kind of isotope. Uh, and here we're dealing with oxygen. Uh, the lighter isotope of oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons. So this is oxygen-16. This is by far the most abundant isotope, um, uh, oxygen isotope found in nature. Uh, there are other kinds of oxygen atoms. One is with, again, eight protons, obviously, but now nine neutrons, and this is oxygen-17. Another one with 10 neutrons, so this is oxygen-18. Uh, this is unstable. And these two are stable, okay? Um, and so you can define R of uh, oxygen-17, for example. This would be the concentration of oxygen-17 in your sample, whatever that is, over the concentration of oxygen-16. You can define the concentration of oxygen, the isotope ratio of oxygen-18, and you can define it similarly, okay? So this is one quantity that is important to know, okay? Uh, another concept that is important is that of a fractionation factor that is the ratio between the number of uh, isotopes in one compound divided by the same ratio in another compound, okay? So suppose you have, here I'm making some weird chemical example, but suppose you have, uh, you know, water isotopes. You could be computing the fractionation ratio, for example, uh, liquid uh, vapor. Suppose you have the ratio... Um, you know, you're computing the ratio of oxygen-18, and this fractionation factor would be the ratio of oxygen-18 um, in vapor over ratio of oxygen-18 in the liquid phase. 
suppose you have, you know, a tank, right, with some water and some water and, and some air. Okay, this air will have some humidity, so it'll have some water vapor, which invariably will contain some oxygen 18 isotopes, and the liquid water also will contain the oxygen 18 isotopes. The, the ratio of isotope ratios in the two phases is one example of a fractionation factor. And finally, um, <clears throat> this is another quantity that is very often used. The, uh, we define abundances as um, the ratio between the isotope ratio in a sample that you're looking at and uh, an isotope ratio of some standard. In the case of water, for example, uh, this is the ratio of the isotope ratio in your sample over the isotope ratio of the so-called Vienna Standard Mean Ocean Water, meaning the isotopic ratio of fresh water. What this measure essentially is how many more isotopes uh, does your sample have compared to fresh water, okay? And this is again an indication that maybe something has happened. If you have more isotopes than fresh water, something might have taken place. Maybe you've undergone condensation, maybe you've undergone some kind of fractionation process. This minus one and plus one, uh, 1,000 is just normalization factors. Uh, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that, um, you know, is the minus one is to show this as an abundance as opposed to a ratio, but essentially the same thing. Um, and uh, one thing that is important is that <clears throat> Uh, fractionation can naturally, I mean, it can happen because of um, various processes that might happen, but it could also happen at thermodynamic equilibrium. In this case, we talk about equilibrium isotope fractionation, okay? So uh, when we think about chemical reactions, for example, uh, this tells us that even if there is no uh, net reaction, right? So if you consider this reaction between H2O and HDS, um, in this one, one uh, hydrogen atom becomes uh, deuterium, it sort of is exchanged. One, um, you start with liquid water with only protium hydrogen, and then this is, um, I don't know what's the English name, let's call it H2S, but where one of the atoms is deuterium, in a gaseous form. Uh, the reaction is that one of the deuterium goes in the liquid form and one of the um, proteums go in the gaseous form. At equilibrium, you'd have as many reaction going, reactions going this way as, as you have going that way, okay? So in this case, you don't have any net reaction and yet you have a fractionation process that is happening between the two, okay? And in this case, uh, it makes sense to define a. Um, um, y it makes sense to define uh, deuterium ratio uh, in the liquid form and in the gas form, and the ratio between the two is a fractionation ratio that we defined before, and this is called equilibrium uh, fractionation ratio. Okay, because we are at thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, and notice that deuterium atoms in general uh, concentrate preferentially within water, okay? And this is due to the fact that hydrogen and, oc and oxygen bind uh, more strongly than, um, than hydrogen and sulfur, okay? In general, however, uh, this is a rule that uh, you should keep in mind when you think about isotopes. Heavier isotopes tend to concentrate preferentially in uh, compounds in which uh, the element is bond uh, more strongly. Okay, moving on. Um, so these were equilibrium effects, okay, where it, when you reach thermodynamic equilibrium, you have, uh, you can still have, um, you know, fractionation. However, not all the fractionation effects happen at equilibrium. You can also have non-equilibrium or sometimes called kinetic effects. Uh, and these are uh, effects that are associated to processes that are unidirectional, such as evaporation, for example, or diffusion. Um, why would diffusion, for example, affect, um, why would diffusion affect 
um, the isotopic composition? Well, because the diffusivity constant of um, of particular uh, material is proportional to the mean velocity of the atoms of this material. And this, if you recall a few lectures ago, is inversely, inversely proportional to the mass of the material that you're diffusing. And so if you have a heavier element, it will move at a lower speed and it will have a lower diffusivity. Okay. So for example, carbon-13 and carbon-12, they diffuse at different they have different diffusivities, okay? That diffuse uh, with different diffusivity constants, okay? Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, there is when dealing with uh, fractionation of uh, any material, is that there is a very simple conceptual framework that has been developed by uh, a scientist called Rayleigh, and this describes the evolution of essentially a multi-phase system where one phase is continuously removed. Um, we're thinking about th th this as an equilibrium fractionation process, okay, which is an idealization, but it makes things simple. And uh, one way to think about this is, you know, like where multi-phase system where one phase is continuously removed. Suppose you have a parcel of air uh, near the surface, and suppose you take this parcel up at greater altitude. As it goes up, it keeps condensing, and it condenses, and it condenses, and the liquid water just keeps getting removed, okay? So, uh, in fact, the process of condensation within an updraft can be considered, uh, to some approximation, can be considered as a Rayleigh process, okay? In formula, this we like this because uh, this can be computed very simply with formula. Uh, and if we start with some isotope ratio, uh, R0, okay, and uh, X0 represents the initial concentration of uh, the particular substance that you're dealing with. It could be the mixing ratio of the water vapor, for example. Uh, at a given point, uh, the, um, if the uh, fraction, if the concentration uh, has gone from X0 to X, okay, uh, then the isotope ratio is given by this very simple formula, okay, where alpha is the uh, fractionation factor for the process. For the very simple case of the parcel going up, this is simply the equilibrium fractionation factor of um, that is given by the ratio of the isotope ratio in the liquid phase and the isotope ratio in the vapor phase, okay, at equilibrium. And x over x0, you can simply substitute the fraction of uh, substance that is left, okay? And so this is quite nice because you start with, uh, you know, let's say that this is the vapor, and you start with a vapor parcel at the surface, you give it some kind of uh, abundance of, for example, oxygen 18, okay? Uh, why does it have oxygen 18? Well, uh, your parcel will contain water vapor, and so some of the molecules in the water vapor will naturally be oxygen-18. How does oxygen-18 change as you move upward? Well, as you reduce the fraction that is left because you're condensing, right, and so you're removing vapor from the vapor phase because it becomes liquid and some of it precipitates out, you can see this goes down and it goes down following this, um, uh, this uh, law over here. Okay, so let's talk about um, let's talk about water isotopes. Now, <clears throat> water is formed by hydrogen and oxygen. This is known to everybody. So, water isotopes will be a combination of hydrogen isotopes and oxygen isotopes. Some of these are introduced earlier on. Uh, the first and most abundant uh, hydrogen uh, isotope is called protium. Okay, uh, this constitutes 99.98% of the hydrogen that is found on Earth. It's stable. Okay, then we have deuterium. This contain one proton and one neutron. It's um, 
in its uh, nucleus. This is also stable, and it makes about 0.01% uh, of the uh, hydrogen that we find on Earth. I mean, deuterium is everywhere. It's in the water that uh, I just drank, and uh, it's in the water vapor you're breathing. It's everywhere. Uh, but it's uh, it exists in very small quantities, okay? And the other element uh, is tritium. This is actually um, a byproduct of um, of um, hydrogen bonds, um, and this is even more rare d than deuterium. So we just say, you know, it's in trace, um, it's almost not detectable, and this is unstable, okay, and it has a uh, decaying time of 12 years, okay, not, not 11, 12 years. Uh, what this means when we say is unstable, um, we mean that um, tritium will become something else, and um, I, we should double check. Um, uh, I should have prepared this, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, that tritium goes, becomes helium. Uh, no, let me, let me actually check. Um, I don't want to give you a wrong information. Um, and uh, I, th th one of the, uh, the main problem with elements that decay is that uh, they turn into another element. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to fill in the time. Um, yes, uh, this is helium, turns into a helium particle, uh, and particularly a helium particle with a positive charge, okay? Plus one electron, plus one other particle that we call neutrino in particular, an, an anti-neutrino. And this is where the problem is, because you start with an atom, you create another atom, which by itself may be okay, but also uh, you create two additional particles. So imagine this atom that at some point something flips inside, okay? And this creates two particles. In this case, it's an electron and a neutrino anti-neutrino. Now, now, neutrinos don't really interact with matter uh, all that much, so this neutrino just shoots off and it'll just keep going forever. Um, neutrinos don't interact almost with anything, so a neutrino can cross a star and not even slow down, okay? So this is lost, but this electron that is uh, shut out uh, it's emitted with some kind of energy, and uh, if you're nearby, this electron will be absorbed by your skin, and this energy will be uh, will be dropped on the molecules of your skin. If you have many tritium atoms that are emitting many electrons, and you know you're su essentially bombarding your skin with these electrons, okay, which are delivering a lot of energy. Um, this energy uh, means that many um, cells on your skin, on yourself, in your, in your body are going to be burned, are going to be damaged. Um, and um, what I'm trying to get at is that, um, I mean, you're, you're going to, you're likely, uh, you know, you could get leukemia. Um, I don't know exactly how you go from these electrons to leukemia, but this is what we call radiation, right? This is the radiation that kills people, okay? Uh, this is one type of radiation. This is called beta radiation. When you emit electrons or positrons, it's called beta radiation. Um, other types of decays emit alpha radiations that are positively charged um, particles, and gamma radiation is photons that are high energy particles of light, essentially. Uh, and these are ionizing radiation uh, and they damage your skin, they damage any tissue that they encounter and uh, they can cause mutations, they can cause permanent damage 
and they can cause um, leukemia. Again, I don't know how, how exactly you get to the leukemia phase, but this is why unstable elements are so dangerous and uh, should be avoided um, in all cases. So we like stable isotopes, but uh, not so much unstable isotopes. Uh, and this is also why, um, you know, nuclear fusion is problematic because it produces a lot of tritium and also why uh, hydrogen bombs create so much radiation. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, hydrogen atoms or the, the hydrogen isotopes. Oxygen also has isotopes and there are three that we know. The, uh, this is a mistake actually, excuse me, it's a typo, it should be eight because uh, oxygen has eight protons. Uh, the most common one has eight protons and eight neutrons. Typically, the most the, the most abundant isotopes are kind of one to one. You know, there are as many protons as, as there are neutrons. Uh, but there are also more unst more sort of rare, heavier isotopes. Um, oxygen seventeen is very rare, and oxygen eighteen is slightly less rare. Okay, and so as you could imagine, when you you could form different combinations of these, right? You could have D two O meaning deuterium 2O, you know, you could have like, you can also write it like this, O, um, D, 2, O, 18, uh, and stuff like that. But if you multiply something rare for something rare, you're going to end up with something extremely rare, okay? And so usually the water isotopes that we care about are a product of something that is rare, so heavier isotopes, and something that is uh, let more common, so lighter isotopes. And in particular, the water isotopes that we uh, will, that we typically deal with in climate science are, well, first of all, the usual H2O. I'm going to write it all. This is the most common. Uh, then we have HDO, uh, or deuterium water. So 1,1H, 2,1H. 16, 8, and finally H2O18, so 1, 1, H, 2, 18, uh, 8, oh. uh, so sometimes these are just called like this, H, H, D, O, these are sort of the m more common ways of writing them down, H2O18, okay, these are the three most common stable water isotopes. Uh, okay, so why are these important? Um, well, they are important because in nature there are uh, th these water isotopes vary naturally, okay? And they vary naturally because of, for example, the location where you are, uh, or they vary because of the processes that an air par parcel has undergone, okay? And if you know um, the isotopic composition of an air parcel, you may be able to know what's happened to that parcel, okay? Um, the, um, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, okay. Um, okay. Let's just talk about uh, what can affect the isotopic composition of rainfall uh, of um, of water isotope, uh, the isotopic composition of air or or um, of an air parcel, and uh, maybe we can get back to the meteoric water line later eventually. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the first pioneers in the study of water isotopes was this guy, a uh, Danish guy, a Danish person called Danskart which is known for other contributions in paleoclimatology as well. Uh, Dunchgard was uh, possibly the first person who realized uh, to use water isotopes. The legend goes that uh, Dunchgard had just bought a mass spectrometer to measure isotopes. And uh, for whatever reason, he threw a dinner party at his house uh, somewhere in, in Denmark. And... Um, you know, they drank beers, uh, they had fun, they were on the rooftop, and um, people 
got back in and went back home, but they left the bottles in um, on the rooftop. And it rained because obviously it's Denmark and so it rains a lot. And the following day, Dansgaard, being the inquisitive person that he was, um, since he had a mass spectrometer, said, hey, I wonder... I wonder what's going to happen if I put the water in, into the ma mass spectrometer. And he started realizing that um, rainfall had, the, the water in rainfall had certain isotopic composition, fresh water had different isotopic composition and whatnot. And this led to uh, the use of isotopes in, um, in um, the use of water isotopes in the study of climate. Uh, Danskart recognized two important factors okay, that uh, affect the isotopic composition of water. The first factor he called the temperature effect. And uh, it's the fact that precipitation in colder weather appears more depleted. Okay, so it has lower abundance, meaning um, it has less heavy isotopes than precipitation in warmer weather. Okay, uh, and this can be kind of understood through a Rayleigh distillation paradigm. Uh, why is this useful? Well, well, if I gave you <clears throat> a uh, if I gave you a uh, a box of water and I told you, oh, this you know is, this is rain that fell somewhere. Well, knowing how much knowing the isotopic composition of this water, you might be able to reconstruct the temperature at which this water fell. Okay, and so it may you may be able to say well, this water fell in Greenland or this water f fell in the tropics. It typically, you are in the, you know, you're, um, well, typically you know where water fell. But suppose I gave you water that fell 10,000 years ago in the tropics or 10,000 years ago in Europe, and I asked, um, you know, given the isotopic composition of this water, what was the temperature like in Europe at the time? And so you can see that in this way, you may be able to reconstruct past temperatures by knowing how um, many heavy isotopes are contained in the, in, the, in the water. Now, we don't, typically, we don't have water that fell millions of years ago, uh, apart from the ice that has accumulated in Antarctica, in the North Pole, and in Greenland, you know, on glaciers. But water can have, uh, you know, can, can have effects. Uh, water can be drunk by um, animals or creatures, and these animals or creatures will kind of make the substances in the water part of their shells or part of their skeletons. And so maybe we can just go and look at skeletons or creatures that lived millions of years ago to reconstruct the, um, the, uh, the temperature at the time. Or, uh, you know, water can have effects, uh, can create like stalagmites and stalactites. Uh, and so maybe if we go to a cave and we look at the isotopic composition of a stalagmite, uh, we may be able to tell what, um, you know, what was the temperature like when that water fell. Uh, this is showing you a map. So this was just a just to show you how good the relationship is, um, this is the um, temperature at different places on Earth. And this is the isotopic, the mean isotopic composition at those places. And you start from um, Marion Islands, Svalbard Islands, and you know you go all the way down to colder and colder places. Notice that there are clearly exceptions, but there is a nice relationship between these two. Uh, another way to see it is uh, you can sort of put together the isotopic composition of the rainfall in different places and kind of create maps of uh, isotopic composition. Notice that as you go uh, further and further north, the isotopic composition, this is delta 18, shown here, the, these, uh, the, the, the rainfall becomes more and more depleted in, uh, in oxygen 18. Uh, interestingly, notice that quite a wide area uh, from quite a wide area that corresponds to the tropics doesn't really feel the temperature effect all that much, right? This is between this is you know sort of 
uh, around minus five per mil. Um, per mil is a symbol like this, and we measure abundances in per mil uh, because remember when I gave you the definition and I said this was uh, R1 over the R standard minus one times 1,000. The fact that you multiply it by 1,000 is the reason why you use a per mil and not a percent. But anyway, um, okay, so this is one thing. And uh, knowing this could help you, you know, if you find, for example, that in Greenland you find um, that, or yeah, in Greenland you find that some uh, ice that fell here had isotopic composition of not minus 15, but plus 10. This may, you know, I don't know, some a while ago, a million years ago, it was plus 10 per mil instead of instead of minus 15 per mil. This would tell you that the temperature at the time was much, much warmer than it is right now. Okay, this is another way to show. Uh, well, this is another way to show it, uh, showing how the isotopic composition during a year changes also. Uh, and so if you are at the uh, Midway Atoll on the in the Pacific Ocean, not quote unquote too far from here, um, seasonal cycle in the tropics is kind of low. This is, I believe this is the deep tropics, so it's pretty close to the equator, relatively close to the equator. But if you go to, pl so the isotopic composition of the rainfall is kind of uh, constant. But if you go to Vienna or Ottawa or Wineyard, uh, there can be huge variations. Um, and again, so this could help you determine um, what season the, as a top, the, the rain fell or how seasons changed uh, through the years. Another thing that um, can have an impact is the so-called amount effect. And this is something that Dunskar had noticed. The amount effect is um, the anti-correlation between the isotopic composition of rainfall and the precipitation rate. So uh, places where it's raining more, even if the temperatures are the same, even if you're in the same spot, um, if it rains more, rain tends to be more depleted of heavy rainfall compared to uh, where it rains less. So if you go to places like the tropics here where uh, temperature doesn't really change much, and so the temperature effect might not be enough to say, hey, you know, what, uh, what are, you know, some changes here, but maybe you could use the amount effect to say, hey, it rained more or it rained less. Okay. Again, the importance of these effects is that you can turn these around and use what you observe to determine the isotopic composition uh, and to determine um, some important quantities related to the precipitation processes at the time um, when precipitation originated. Um, different weather systems also have different kinds of um, isotopic signals, for example. And so, you know, one frontier in research today is that you could actually use isotopes to learn something about not only the climate 10,000 years ago, but also something about uh, the weather systems, thunderstorms or uh, warm fronts or, or whatnot. Um, yeah. So, uh, the, well, this application to uh, paleoclimate is pretty much what I showed you, what I just told you. And in fact, if you go and look at, um, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but if you go and look at paleo data, um, very often you see something like this where you have temperature on one axis and delta 18 on the other axis. Um, this is essentially the reason why um, and, and the way, or one of the ways in, at least in which temperature is reconstructed. Not only, not the only way in which these, this is reconstructed, um, but uh, but it is one of the one of the ways. Um, yeah. So and at high latitudes, maybe you want to use the ice that fell on like at the poles, for example, or in Greenland. Um, at lower latitudes, you could use uh, creatures called foraminifera, 
and these are tiny little shells and their shells are made mostly by calcium carbonate which should have this formula um, and because it's form it's made of calcium cal calcium carbonate some of these some of this oxygen is the oxygen that was present in the rainfall or the ocean for example and some of this oxygen will be present in uh, the heavier isotope form and so once you collect the you know a uh, large number of foraminifera shells these once they die they fall to the bottom of the ocean and um uh, you could go to the bottom of the ocean collect these uh, then take tiny pieces of their shells pass them through a mass spectrometer determine the isotopic ratios and from those you can then determine things like the temperature of the ocean when these uh, tiny little creatures died or you know lived or died they, they don't live uh, on they don't live that long um, okay this is pretty much what I had to say uh, about uh, about isotopes again this is not really uh, traditionally part of the you know the microphysics the the microphysics part of of classes but um, I just thought because it's so widely used and in an atmospheric science curriculum or meteorology curriculum is typically not taught I thought it would be good uh, to see it once and for all to see some of these things you don't need to remember the details but just keep in mind uh, why isotopes are useful and um, and uh, what they could be used for if some of these things were not cleared or you know you're very very unfamiliar with uh, please shoot me an email and um, and we can discuss what is not uh, what is not clear uh, otherwise um, this concludes the part of microphysics and next time after the quiz slash exam uh, next time, we will start with the part on atmospheric radiation. Thank you very much, and I'll see you for the next lecture.